morning, everybody. Ready to get started this morning on the ice? Okay. We are ready. Good. We are going to welcome sled hockey coach and director of therapeutic recreation and military programs at Craig's Hospital, Tom Carr, who is joined by U.S. Army veteran Eric Tasso. Both Eric and Tom are going to provide us with some skills, equipment information, and exercises during today's ice hockey live. Um, without delay, Tom, Eric, are you ready to show us some stuff? We are getting in this morning and uh, spent a little time on the hockey rink with Eric and myself. Again, my name is Tom Carr, and I'm the director of therapeutic recreation and military programs at Craig Hospital, which is a, uh, a uh, spinal cord and brain injury rehabilitation hospital here in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Eric, uh, sled hockey player and veteran, as they said, and, and we'll get to him a little bit as he demos some of our stuff. I just want to take a second and thank Craig and the leadership for allowing me to come and be a part of this. And thank everyone at the Winter Sports Clinic for adapting and, and making this happen in these uncertain times. So thank you to uh, Teresa and all the staff there at the Winter Sports Clinic. Thank you. And hopefully everyone gets something out of this. Um, just a brief overview for everybody. Um, what we are going to do here is we're going to spend a little time this morning going over sled hockey equipment. We're going to spend some time going over the skating basics and some demonstration stuff from Eric. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some off ice training or what you can do to strengthen and get prepared to be active in the sport of sled hockey. Talk a little bit about where and how you can find a local team or somewhere to get involved. Uh, if we have time, we have some tips and tricks that we want to share both for equipment as well as the sport itself. And then we really want to spend some time this morning with your questions. So please uh, type them in the chat uh, or whatever the case is. If we can zoom in on something and show it more specifically, we're happy to do that. Um, yeah, let's just have a little fun this morning. And again, looking forward to seeing everyone in person in the next uh, at the Winter Sports Clinic next year. Um, Eric, anything to add? I uh, covered it. <laughs> there, there you go. Thanks. Eric is going to keep me in line. I talk too much. First thing, as we're going to talk about, just really quickly, is we are here at the uh, at the Broadmoor World Arena here in Colorado Springs. It's obviously a beautiful sheet of ice, but don't think that you need to rent ice or do something like that or have access to ice to participate or try sled hockey. Eric and I were talking this morning. There's a lot of ways to access ice. If you live in a part of the United States that has a colder winter where you can get out on a pond or a lake if it's safe and frozen, that's a great place to practice and skate. And most rinks around the country also have open skate times or stick and puck time that doesn't require a huge investment. It could be $10 or less to get out there and skate and sleds are allowed at those type of activities. So no, there's lots of ways to do it. You don't need a beautiful empty sheet of ice here in Colorado Springs to do this. You can find it and, be, and access it right in your own backyard. Um, let's just dive right into equipment so I can kind of keep this going. I know no one wants to hear me talk all morning and really wants to see Eric in the sport in action, but I really want to talk to everyone who doesn't know about what the pieces of equipment we're talking about for sled hockey. Before we get into the specific kind of adaptive pieces, there are some regular pieces of equipment, regular hockey pieces of equipment that are absolutely mandatory for sled hockey and being safe out on the ice. You'll see Eric and I are both wearing helmets. That is an absolute must. If you're going to be using pucks, also having a face shield is going to be absolutely um, not only for a puck flying up and hitting you in the face, but you do have two of those sticks in your hand, and every other player out there if you're playing sled hockey has sticks too. So the last thing you want to do is catch one of those in the face. So helmets are absolutely crucial. Other things you're going to absolutely need are gloves. Some type of hockey glove is going to be important. Um, you'll see in a second, we utilize our gloves for a lot more than just handling the sticks. It is also propulsion and things of that nature. So having good hockey gloves are important. Last two mandatory pieces. Oh, Eric's got them on. Elbow pads are an absolute must. So having elbow pads, because falling is part of hockey, it is certainly part of sled hockey. So having this protected is going to be a big piece. And then I'll point at Eric, because it's right here. Again, it, having shin guards, so guards that go over the front of the leg, is standard hockey equipment as well, as you see. We will use that piece of equipment not only to protect from pucks flying through the air, but as Eric just showed, the bottom of these sticks, which we'll get to, have sharp picks on them. So protecting uh, the shins and any exposed stuff from getting poked is going to be super, super important, especially for someone who may not have sensation or anything like that. So shin guards are important as well. When you get up in a sled hockey and are playing more competitively, shoulder pads, chest pads, there's a variety of other things that you can do. But the basics to get started, helmet, gloves, elbow pads, and shin guards are an absolute must in the pads department. Um, 
Okay. So that's just kind of the regular hockey stuff. And as Eric and I were talking the other day, it doesn't mean you have to spend a ton on that either. Lots of good used hockey equipment are available out there. You can find gloves and sticks, not, excuse me, parts of sticks, but gloves and shin guards and stuff that play it against sports or various places around. So know that there's places you can get them at a, without spending a ton of money. Okay. To the heart of sled hockey, or in some parts of the world, also called sledge hockey. It's, it's not, the names mean the same. In the United States, we call it, call it sled hockey, but most places around the world also call it sledge. This is a sled or sledge, depending on where you're talking about. This is the piece of equipment that is going to be absolutely crucial to getting around on the ice. We'll talk about Eric, and he'll show us his setup in a second. But for, there's basically a few parts to it. Bucket being this part right here, think of it as the boot of a hockey skate. That is where someone sits in and makes contact with the ice. Just like uh, if those who ski or mono ski or stand up skate, it should fit the exact same way. Tight, but not necessarily uncomfortable. If you're moving around too much in the bucket, that energy that you are using does not transfer necessarily down to the ice. You get a lot of kind of play in that piece of equipment. So if you see Eric kind of shifting his hips here a little bit back and forth, the sled moves with him. So any movement he makes, because his bucket fits him well, transfers down to the blades, and that's exactly what we want to see. The next piece, and should be very familiar to hockey players, or anybody for that matter, who spend any time on the ice, is blades. As you will see, there are two hockey blades on the bottom of this sled. There's also two on the bottom of Eric's, but as you'll see, his are a much different width than the one that I'm showing here. He's got a one and a half inch channel is what it's called between his blades. The one I'm looking at here is probably more like it's three and a half. So know that this is one of the pieces of the sled. The bucket is important to get fit right, but it's not very adjustable. Blades are very adjustable. And the piece that's important is that width. So the wider apart, like the setup I have here in front of you, the wider apart they are, it provides more stability. So back and side to side, it absolutely will stop someone who will be harder to fall over onto the side. But it is also harder to turn, get up onto edge and initiate turning as we're going. So there's a give and take between those. Beginning skaters, great to start a little wider or maybe even wider inches apart. And as you progress and advance, Eric has narrowed his blade quite a bit in the last couple of years as he's going, especially if someone's going to be competitive, the narrow skate or a narrow blade width is going to be important. Next piece that's important and adjustable on this sled is the length. So if you look at Eric and his sled, and he'll scoot over here, he will show a great seating position in this. The length is where your feet make contact all the way back to where your hips are. You do not want to necessarily have your legs totally out extended. Um, again, especially with someone who has strength or sensation, it can be very uncomfortable to be out that way. It stretches the hip flexors, which can be a little tough to sit in for a while. So having a good bend in the knee is going to be important. Also snugs you back nicely and securely into the bucket. So that's, this is a very nice seating position. If someone finds themselves either too short where their knees are rising up too high, that's where you'd extend the sled out until you have a comfortable bend. Or if they find themselves too far out where their legs are totally flat, that's where you'd want to push it in until you find a comfortable spot. Eric, do you want to talk about the just how long it's taking you to find this kind of style for your sled or, or depth? Or this how it's changed over the years for you? Uh, yeah, I definitely started out with more bend in the knees because my legs weren't bending. So I started doing a stretching routine in, in the mornings to get my knees to bend properly because I'm a para. Uh, but having them out too far, one, doesn't allow you to get in front of your in front of your skate in front of the front of your, your sled, uh, which is really problematic when you're coming up against a wall, a teammate, uh, other player, or the puck just trying to get around it. So having them bent a little bit gives you a little bit more stability, and it also uh, allows you to get in front of your skate if needed. So, excellent. Thank you. The other piece, which we'll dive right into here, is the, probably the last piece of adaptive equipment. Obviously, the sled is different from stand-up skates or folks who maybe have not tried a sled hockey before, so there, that is an adaptive piece of equipment, the sled. And the other piece is the modifications that are made to the sticks themselves. So unlike stand-up hockey, your sticks do everything. Stand-up hockey is pretty much passing and shooting. For sled hockey, the stick does everything for you. It is your propulsion. It is how you pass. It is how you shoot. All of the things that you need in sled hockey, you have a stick. Fortunately, we have two of them. So for the advantage that sled hockey players have, and for folks, everyone I know is either right or left-handed, but being able to use both sticks, right and left, with the pass, shoot, 
and especially for propulsion, is extremely important. If you look on the bottom of this stick, there is a pick. It is as sharp as it looks. That is used, and there are, I don't have it off the top of my head, but there are <laughs> depths for this. So I believe it's only three millimeters, I believe, is the depth of that pick. But that is what is used to propel the sled as you're going on and make contact with the ice. So as you'll see here, it's also the angle that's very important. We'll talk about that here in a second. Sled hockey sticks have evolved a ton in the last few years. You can buy a one-piece full carbon stick that's made by a variety of uh, hockey companies that are out there. Warrior makes them. Um, but Eric and I both agree, you can also buy just the blade piece and add in your own uh, shaft as you're going. Sticks are probably also the piece of equipment that breaks the most. So we'll talk a little bit about equipment and how to protect them, but sled hockey is not the most expensive adaptive sport, but if you start breaking a lot of sticks, it can add up. Uh, so just know sticks are an adaptive piece as well. Good, anything to add to sticks? Good, okay, cool. That's enough talking, well, it's not true. I will talk more and I'm sorry, but enough of that. We'll do a little bit of demo here as we're going. A little bit, we'll talk about getting moved out on the ice. Now I'm going to stop everybody right away. If you are waiting to see when Eric is going to rip a shot into the back of the net or something like that, you're going to be waiting for a second because we are going to spend a lot of this time working on skating. It is the most important part of sled hockey. It doesn't matter if you have the greatest shot in the game. If you can't get from here to there or here to where the puck is, it doesn't make a difference. So we're going to spend a majority of this time talking about obviously the, ski, the technique the proper position to be sitting in a sled. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, mostly about moving around on the ice. If we have some time or if there are some questions, we will get into passing. We will get into shooting a little bit if we have time. But again, those things are secondary to moving around the ice. Um, doing good? Any questions on there that we see? Or should I just plow on? A plow on. All right. Just remember, any questions for anyone out there? Um, again, feel free to just drop those into the chat. We'll try and get to those as we're going. So first and foremost, when it comes to moving on the ice, uh, first of all, the hardest thing to do is to get started. So if you are from a still position, moving on the ice is very difficult to do. So in a second, um, we'll talk and we'll see Eric. When he's out here demo, you will not see him stopping. Also hockey players, when they're out there playing, I want them moving when they're out on the ice. The only time someone should be sitting still is when they're on the bench or in the penalty box. Outside of that, they should be moving around on the ice. So we don't talk about stopping a whole heck of a lot today. First thing to do is to show, as you look at Eric here, where he is reaching to make contact with the ice to get starting is basically right now, slightly in front of them. That is a good spot to start. What you don't want to do is the urge to do this and reach way forward. What people think is, oh my gosh, I got to get going. They reach way forward. What happens is their sticks pretty much slip right out from under them. That was a bad example of slipping that, right out. That was, that was. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> you don't want to reach too, too far out in front of you, especially when it comes to getting started. So what you'll see Eric doing here in a second is he's going to start with short little uh, strokes with the sticks at the hip to get started. Once he is up and moving, he's going to be short ones again and then kind of extend. Once he is moving along the ice, he can start to extend that again. So from a still position, sticks at the hips. Very nice. Good. Very nice. So that's what it looks like. If you can't, you have to resist that urge to reach very, very far out in front of you and pull. Short strokes, short strokes get you going. After that, the power that's created does not come from reaching more forward. Once Eric is up and going with short strokes, he starts to make speed, gain speed and propulsion by pushing behind him. So the movement up and going, short strokes, and then what you're doing to pick up speed, the power is this way behind you, not this way in front of you. So Eric, show me again. Give me a couple of laps here around too. Short strokes to get going. And as he accelerates across the middle of the ice, Very nice. Very 
All too often, common mistake from the new sled hockey player is they're like, I want to go faster. And our first reaction for faster is to do this. Reach forward on the ice. That does nothing to you. It actually slows your stroke down. Your stroke should be at the hips and following through. That is how you pick up and gain speed. So that is the first piece I've picked up. Anything to add to that, Eric? Uh, the hockey players. Man, a few words. <laughs> as long as you don't have to drop the gloves later, we should be okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's great. Excellent demo, by the way. Okay, good. The other thing, so Eric's gonna come over here and we'll talk about both these sleds here for a second. Um, for folks who've been to the Winter Sports Clinic or who participate in other sports, um, especially skiing, there are different types of movements or turns that can be made. The ones that we're gonna focus on, well, the ones we want to focus on for hockey and skiing are edging movements. But a mistake that early sled hockey players make is they make a movement that's called a rotary movement. So like we talked about, there are two blades at the bottom of this sled. What we want to see is an edging turn, which is this type of movement. But what we often see, as Eric is doing right here, is a movement with both blades on the ice. That is the turn we call a rotary movement. That is not going to work for sled hockey. Two reasons. One, the sled is not designed for that purpose. It is designed to be up on edge, and we're going to show that in a second. Rotary movements, primarily when you have a rotary type movement, it ends up tipping the sled over or something that we call high side, which ends up falling, sliding across the ice. we got a question. Yeah, we got a question. Go ahead. Yes. How do you sanitize the equipment after using it? That's great. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, give you I stick it in a mesh bag and I wash it in the washing machine. Because you want to put it in a mesh bag because there's all the Velcro and everything, so it kind of protects the gear. So I use a mesh bag and I put it in the wash. Great. And I will also say, and I'll, and I'll refer to this because this is the standard that I use, USA Hockey put out um, this year, especially during these COVID times, a uh, uh, guidelines for sanitizing both hockey equipment and not necessarily sled hockey equipment, but that is the, that's the guideline that we have used going forward is what sled hockey uh, has used both in terms of sanitizing and making sure that equipment, especially pads and helmets and stuff are thoroughly dried afterwards. If someone wants to follow up with me afterwards, I'm happy to provide a link to that resources or that's something that uh, I'll talk to the folks at the Winter Sports Clinic and make sure we get posted on the website so that folks have access to it. It's a great question. Thank you. Don't put it in the dryer. Hang your stuff up. Put it on the, if it's summertime, put it out in the room. Uh, if it's winter, put them all on top of the heat vent or something. Don't, don't dry it from the dryer. Though. That'll ruin your gloves and everything else. Hockey players take some pride in having gross, disgusting, smelly equipment. Please don't. It does not have to happen. So I'm just going to throw that piece out there. All right. Especially if you want to stay married or whatever the case might be. Okay, so back to rotary and edging movements here, which we were just talking about. So, Eric, turn and face the camera here a little bit. Good. So, rotary movement shown, just sliding back and forth. This is rotary. As you can see, he's just kind of pivot both skates. Looks good, and actually an early movement made by sled hockey players, but it's just not. So what I want is play around with feeling what the up on edge means. So as Eric's showing kind of here, he's using his glove to brace himself on the side that he's making that turn. That time a little bit too far. All right, let me disclaimer time. Eric played a bunch of games a couple weeks ago in the sled hockey tournament. So his fatigue level, we won't talk about, but he's definitely feeling it today. Uh, so as you'll see from the blade, he's moving it up onto edge. The sled, and more importantly, the blade, is designed to turn on edge. All Eric has to do, I'm going to send him out here to do a couple of turns, is gently tip that skate on edge. So we gain some speed, tip it step ever so slightly onto edge. Eric, are you doing anything else besides getting that thing on edge? <laughs> so that, you can see again, so watch, get the weight push, hand down. Good. Kind of gives him that second point of contact. And down. Good. And the, the skate comes right around. Very common mistake made by early sled hockey players is to do more of a rotary or a movement that looks like this in the sled. I really want that movement should be side to side. Um, yeah. Eric, anything to add to that? How long does it take? Is that easy skill to learn or does that take a second? I think at least a year in edge. Okay. But then uh, if you, <clears throat> I think that uh, the more waste control you have, the better off. So like 
I was only able to get an edge because I'm starting to wear a belt right here and I have a high back skate. So having an idea of where that edge is for me is important. So if you don't, if you can't find the edge, maybe try a high back or maybe try something, but if, but if you're not a pair, you probably don't need it. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit more on some of the strengthening things and things you want to do to get prepared to go out and play sled hockey, as well as some tips. We'll show that back on the sled, as you will see, we don't have on this one. So we'll get to that one in equipment here in a second. Okay. What you guys are going to hear me not talk about now is how to stop. As I said before, and if these guys don't mind panning around the rink here for a second, if you look around here, stopping, especially if you're playing on a hockey rink, it takes care of itself. All right. I want players when they're on the ice to be moving at all times, like I talked about. They don't want to be moving. They can come and sit next to me on the bench. Outside of that, we move when we're out on the ice. Stopping, like I said, these boards will take care of it. And honestly, it's an advanced kind of turning move that comes with time. How long did it take you to figure out how to stop? Uh, <laughs> I love it. So you're one of my guys. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That there's no reason to work on stop. You always want to be moving. Again, back to what we said before, getting started from a stop is the hardest thing to do. So we don't really want to do it. Constantly moving on the ice will not hear me talk about or coaching stopping until way down the road. So again, moving constantly out there, good stick position and edging work is gonna be really important. What we are gonna talk about is an absolute crucial part of the game. Happens to absolutely everyone. I don't care if it's your first day on the ice or you're one of the six military members who's on our national team currently. You will fall over. You will fall over on your own or you will fall over because someone puts you there. Either one of those reasons you gotta get up and you also have to get up pretty quick. This is probably the toughest skill to learn and requires the most amount of strength. We're gonna go through a couple of techniques for how to do that. And we'll spend a little bit of time with that. We got a question? We got another question from Matt who asks, what type of seating do you use or recommend? Foam or Aspen seat kits or something like that? Sure. You wanna take that first and then I'll answer. Uh, if you don't need to add anything to the actual sled, don't. Very thin, like inch pad underneath my butt and on the back. But if you don't have to add much to the sides, then don't do it. Uh, you don't want a whole lot. You want to be able to transfer all of your energy. So uh, I did have one from Aspen Seating. It was working pretty decent. Uh, but uh, I changed things up with the high back, and then I've gone to a different sled. So uh, the bucket that I have right now is like like a 14 inch waist, and I usually have like a 17, 18 inch chair. So I shrink things way down so that I can get myself really tight in the bucket to be able to move. Yeah. It's a great question. It's not, I don't mean hard to answer, but it's going to really vary from everything. So for somebody who starts out, and one thing I want to talk about really is really skin integrity. So again, for somebody who may not have sensation um, or, or movement or sensation, you should be super cautious about the seating system. Eric is absolutely correct. There are There is a spin pad that comes in most skates. And again, everyone has to figure out what they're, what they're both safe with their skin and comfortable with. So usually starting with a little bit more padding is absolutely going to be important and making sure that after you're out on the ice for any amount of time, doing a skin check to make sure that there's no red marks, hot spots or anything that is important too. Probably the first time, err on the side of having a little bit more padding and stuff to make sure that all the areas are protected, especially underneath on your butt and all those kind of phony processes and things like that for sure but eric how many years have you been playing now it's almost three almost three years of playing and his bucket just the same it's not only not only the bucket itself but how you see it has probably changed it's evolving yeah always evolving yeah so that's always going to change so when someone figures out maybe the areas they have to have areas they don't to eric's point you want to remove or right, make sure that you're in as much contact with the bucket as you can be the more kind of space padding cush that you put in there, maybe it's more comfortable, but it is going to affect how your energy is transferred down to the skate. So safety, absolute skin integrity first. After that, what you can do to increase performance and being successful when you're out of the ice. So for sure. That's a great question. So yeah, keep those coming, please. Again, very individualized system and always evolving. I just want to make sure we talk about that. Both every part of the sled, seating all the way down to positioning, to blades, to height, all of those things change and evolve as a player continues to either play hockey or skate recreationally, depending on what their goals are, really will dictate what the sled looks like and how it fits for you. So, great. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, okay. Uh, getting up. 
So falling, we don't have to teach everybody. Falling also takes care of itself. Like I said, get yourself afflicted, or if you're out there playing with other players, someone will introduce you to the ice at some point. When that happens, we go all the way. Up. Okay. Usually, Eric has now come across the ice, slid to a stop because he got knocked into next week. But he has now come to a stop. Getting up is going to be important. Two things. One, resist the urge if the puck is over here to reach for it. Okay? Get back up. That should be your first thing to do. Where's Eric? How far can you reach? He's not going to get there. He can reach as hard as he wants. But what is going to happen is some players can skate right by, take that from him, and he's still going to be on the ice. So if you fall over, your first thing to do should be to get up. Okay? Eric, you want to talk us through it? So you want to get the, the blade in contact with this. That's going to help the most. So if you figure out how to do that, that'll stop you from moving around. Because without that, you know, I can, I can push up all I want, but I'm not getting anywhere. So if I can get the blade... Another way of doing it, if uh, you don't have the strength in that arm yet to do this, would be if you get your blade in, get your stick on the opposite side, and push up. <laughs> practice. Let's try it again. Not practice. I'm going to give him the fatigue pass card on this one. All right, let's try this other side. All right, so you put your stick into the ice. Try to keep yourself as stable as you can when you're pushing up. Otherwise, you do what I just did and fall over the place. And then you can get yourself back onto your plate. Honestly, the easiest way to get it done is in that hand. You need to get to the point here to push that blade in and then just push yourself up. I find it easier to lean forward, get myself more centered on top of the blade. I'll just turn the long way. Eric just touched on something really briefly that I forgot to mention, but I think it's super important, um, which goes back to the seating position. If you look at Eric sitting in here and what he just talked about, getting up off the ice is important to be leaning forward. Well, you don't want to be doing it. I'm not going to make him do it. Just lean back. If you, if you find yourself in a position that you'd be rather watching TV in than playing hockey, you're in the wrong position. That won't help you for turning, shady shooting, anything. You want to be in what I like to call a athletic seated position. This is an athletic seated position. Bend in the knees, bend in the elbows. He's slightly leaned forward. He's ready to make an athletic movement from the seated position. That is the exact same for getting up off the ice. If Eric is splayed out and laying back, there is no way he's going to be able to get up. There's no way he's going to be able to push. There's no way he's going to be able to do anything. So being in an athletic seated position is very, very important. Got, and the other piece I will say is everyone watching here on TV as well. How how is your getting up with all over the three years of doing sled hockey? I mean, it, it, the best part is that you're always learning how to get up when you first start because you're always on your butt, <laughs> you're always on your side. So it takes you, uh, you know, six months, but after that six months, you know, you're on your, you'll be able to get up within a couple seconds. And again, it, and, it, and Eric's absolutely right, but I will tell you, probably the most exhausting part of early sled hockey play is getting up off the ice. Eric's right, it happens a lot. It is absolutely, and then even more frustrating than that, which every player's experience, is the high side. You push so hard to get up that you end up tipping over the other way. So Eric, in a hurry, goes to get up and goes down the other way. These are all things that are absolutely common and are absolutely expected to new players. So please don't feel bad. Getting up off the ice is, and when you are sore the next day after playing sled hockey, it's not going to be from pushing. It is going to be from the 20 times plus that you had to get up off the ice. So understand it is absolutely a strength move and it takes practice. So I want everyone to understand that is not going to happen overnight. No player. Anyone tells you they popped up the first time they fell over playing sled hockey is lying to you. All right? It takes time and it absolutely takes practice. Everybody's saying they've done that a lot. No, I'm sore after this. <laughs> Good. And I'm okay with sore. But what I'm not okay with is being so frustrated that people don't want to go back out and do it again. So understand there's techniques and things to play around with. But Eric's right. Staying forward, really getting to engage that hand in the ice and pop yourself back up. Again, that's one of those things, and we'll talk about it here in a second, about some things that you can do off ice. That's something that folks can do anyway. You don't need ice. You don't need anything to practice your mobility and sitting up from a laying position. Carpet, watching TV, doing something like that. Get off the couch, down onto the floor, 
over, can I get myself back up? Over, can I get myself back up? Think of it as the, uh, the, the sit up equivalent of sled hockey here, because for, especially for folks who don't have a ton of core, how much core do you have, Eric? Uh, so Eric does not have any core to engage to do this activity. So to do it, it's really all arm and shoulder strength. And he has had to build that over time. Um, spin around for me one thing as we talk about some sleds here. I just want to show, because Eric talked about it briefly before, without having any core, so not having a lot of abdominal strength. This is how high, if, you, if folks can see this, that the back on Eric's sled comes up to. Um, just, 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 right here. just right there. So Eric has had his sled comes up to the point where he can start to have some contact with the sled where he has some sensation, which is all the way up here. If you look around here, these are two kind of, not gate belts, but kind of elastic uh, straps that come around. That is how he is. Think of it as, a, think of it as an artificial ab that comes around here and gives him that contact to the sled. For folks who do have, you know, good core strength, some core have some or a lot of core strength. If you don't have that, you really got to have a higher back to make sure that you can do the activities we're talking about, both skate around the ice successfully and get up after you fall down. Yeah, we got a question about do you sharpen your own skates and what do you recommend on how to do that? Awesome. Eric? Uh, I don't sharpen my own. And uh, I have to say, you just play around. Find the sharpest, find the dullest, see which one works for you. Usually the middle, I can't remember what it is, I think it's half. Yeah. Usually that's the best because it's better for speed and it's also good for control. So I usually go with the half. Yeah. I would agree. And the other thing I would say, especially if you're talking sled hockey, most rinks do sharpen skates. Most kind of hockey stores or skate shops or stuff will, will sharpen skates as well. They're not used to working on a sled. So obviously the blades have to come off to be sharpened. But quite honestly, you can make really good friends at the rink and have someone play around with it with you. So Eric's right, quarter inch, half inch, whatever it is, you may have to play around with what works for your style. Just a standard kind of sharpening may or may not work for you. So getting to know someone at the rink, showing them the skate, they'll be super engaged in something that's cool and new. And together you guys can play around, figure out a, uh, an angle and a sharpening that works for you. Yeah. So Teresa asked, is the back on Eric's sled as high as they make them or do some sleds have a higher back or a lower back? Higher. Yep. They make them higher. Uh, and then from now you just want to cut them down. So if you, you get it as high as you can, want to just trim them down so almost every part of the sport is uh you just kind of adapt to make it yours uh because everybody's got a little bit different going on so good we've been chatting a lot so before i dive into some strength and on ice stuff i want eric if you don't mind some figure eight so let's put all those pieces together we'll skip the all for now so again getting started from a stop short pushes and then extending that hand on the ice I'll kind of narrate as we're going here around and show some stuff. Eric is putting his hand down as that second point of contact, one blade, one hand. As you can see, that bend in the elbow shows that he's not pushing with a ton of weight on The other thing he's doing nicely is pushing with that off hand. So he continues through the entire turn as he's going. Hand down. Last piece, which I didn't talk about earlier, which Eric is also doing a pretty good job with is don't forget to look in the direction that you want to go. Just like everything else, and I talked about this at the clinic of folks who've been there before. If you look down at the ice, you're going down at the ice. So I tell everyone to pick their head up and look the direction they want to go. If Eric's going to want to make a 180 degree turn, he's going to have to look back. Or from how many games? Uh, five games of hockey, guys. That's a lot. So I don't know no matter where you are. That's a lot of hockey. It's good. good to, excellent. Excellent. Okay. A couple of off ice things I want to hit on, and then like some leave a little time for questions unless we have one. Okay. Off ice stuff. So again, maybe you don't have equipment yet. Maybe you don't have access to an ice rink yet. What are some things that you can do? 
at the very highest level, there's a company out there called Concept2. They make what's called a Nordic ski ergometer. So it's kind of like a rowing machine when it mounts on a wall. It basically puts you in a position to do this type of exercise. A Concept2 ski erg is a great thing. It's also pretty expensive, so I don't expect everyone to have it. I see it a lot more and more at gyms, especially on the East Coast companies out of Vermont, but we're starting to see more of them. No, you don't need a fancy piece of equipment to do that. A couple of fair bands hooked up to make a movement that gets you in this type of movement is great. Another thing and a great cross training tool is also doing other sports. So Nordic skiing, for example, is a very similar movement. Nordic skiing is a movement that is very similar to sled hockey and practices and gets those same muscle groups and strength that we want to propel ourselves around the ice. What do you do? Off ice hockey. What do you do? Uh, I swim quite often, as often as I can. And then I also have a hand cycle. The hand cycle helps out building the other muscles around it, get the smaller muscles going. So honestly, if you just uh, do a bunch of different activities, you'll be, you'll be just fine. And uh, you won't be stuck with the uh, arms just in the side of your body. <laughs> no back muscles, whatever. So. I would absolutely agree. I don't care, and, and I, again, now teaching for a moment, I don't care if that goes for sled hockey, goes for anything to me. A well-rounded athlete does a variety of things. One, makes you a better athlete. Two, makes you just more less susceptible to injuries, like Eric was saying. If all Eric did all, all day, every day, was go out on the ice and skate, he would be weakening other parts of his body and setting himself up to have some type of injury, especially as somebody who uses those arms all day, every day to push around. Want to make sure, especially that shoulder and stuff is protected. To do that, stretching, you know, stretching, weight activities, and then some other activity to counterbalance what we're doing here. Hands like like swimming, I love things of that nature that kind of keep someone a broad athlete and making sure that they're active and ready to do sled hockey or honestly whatever else they choose to do. Those things all that. Great, great, good stuff. Um, I'll touch on getting involved. I want to see if there's any other questions out there. We got some tips and tricks to fill some time here too. Again, sled hockey continues to be one of the fastest growing team sports in the country, and it's nationwide. I don't care if you live in Florida, California, the Northeast, Minnesota, wherever the case might be, there's a sled hockey team hopefully around and near you. Um, talk to the folks here at the Winter Sports Clinic. We're going to get some resources up there for how and where to find a sled hockey team or program near you. Um, outside of that, the uh, Move United, it's a youth formerly known as Disabled Sports USA, has a great map in uh, program finder on their website as well. As I'm sitting here saying this, I do want to emphasize one thing. Not everyone who gets on the ice has to play hockey. There may be a team around you and that's great, but your goal for playing hockey or getting out on the ice might be fitness, might be skating with your kids, might be getting out to the middle of the lake to ice fish, might be any of those things. We talked and focused on hockey here today, but understand that this equipment can be used to access the ice, be fit and healthy in a variety of ways. So don't think it means you have to go out there play five games on a weekend, not be able to pick yourself up like Eric looks like. You don't need to do that. Uh, fun, certainly a great way to get involved. A number of veteran-only teams as well as community teams. Lots of stuff out there, but no, access to the ice, getting out there, being healthy and active is our goal, and this is just one way to do that. You to think about that? Uh, it's really nice because I have family come in. We have red skates. Obviously, COVID kind of destroyed this year, but – as a family, all you really need, you know, you need the gloves, your sticks, and then your elbow pads, and you can go out in the ice and just, you know, mess around with, uh, with your kids and your wife and whatnot. It's really a nice way to get out and uh, be outside. Agreed. Agreed. That's We're all dying for it. Any questions coming in? Or should we just keep on going? Great. Keep on going. A couple of tips and tricks here as we're going along. You want to do the glove one first? I love this one. This yeah. is one I just learned recently. Go ahead. So the... Uh, uh, this glove's been covered. I covered this glove with uh, Flex Seal. So one, I touch the, the ice so often and it cuts the gloves up. So people are constantly losing the pads that are in here. And they're having to change the gloves out. So I've actually coated these front two uh, pads with uh, Flex Seal and it protects from the ice. And it also gives me a little extra grip. So when you saw me getting up, I probably would have been slipping a lot more if I didn't have the Flex Seal down on those tips. So it does help uh, getting up off the ice. You should have yeah, the base glove too. If you don't. So then also, we'll tear through gloves like crazy trying to use the sticks to push. So you're constantly getting holes. So I'm right now I'm using, uh, I think they're golf gloves, but I have golf gloves on both sides. They're really thin. And it just gives my hands a little extra cushion so I don't have blisters all the time because 
by the time you get one game through all the pushing that you were doing, you're, you're probably going to have some kind of blister. So that helps out, you know, protecting your hands on the inside. Um, most skaters don't, you know, stand up skaters don't have to worry about that because they're not using the sticks nearly as often. Also, uh, I'm using the tapes. They have them in most hockey stores. Uh, and it gives me the ability to move my glove up and down without getting stuck on the tape. Because if you're taping a stick normally, uh, what will happen is this stuff's sticky. So you, you grab it and then you can't get your glove down when you want to take a shot or pass it. Now, uh, a way to do, a way to use tape and still get by is you wax the, you wax the top and the bottom with a hockey wax or you use baby powder and you baby powder both edges. That way it allows your glove to slip through. I actually have enjoyed these though. Uh, I've had to adapt them a little bit. They weren't long enough, so I cut some more pieces off and attached it. But uh, they actually grip pretty well and they'll last about, about 10 games. Then you have to do new ones, but um, either one works. But just know that if you just put tape on here, put your glove on, you're gonna rip through your gloves really quick. And uh, probably put blisters on your hand and, and you'll have to be buying $150 gloves again. So try not to do that. I got a question. Uh, I don't know if it's a question or more of a comment. Bradford says, what if you lose a two? Something like that happened in years past. <laughs> don't flinch. <laughs> if you're gonna hit the board, don't don't flinch. <laughs> the good news is, and like we talked about in the beginning, I hope that that is a funny comment. Fortunately, I have all of mine here, but that's pure luck, I promise you. But again, back to what we talked about at the beginning with equipment. And again, <laughs> even if you're out on the ice, if you are out with other players, it, it the, the face shield is important. A full face shield is. I'm here as a coach. I traditionally stand up when I'm out coaching sled hockey. That is also fraught with its own level of danger here for sure. But having this here, and I'm not going to hit him in the face, the game gets intense or people get intense and there's lots of reaching and poking. If someone goes to do it, it's more the stick that can get someone in the face than it is a puck. A puck can too, absolutely. But we certainly recommend for safety, as is USA Hockey, if you're going to be out there playing, Full face shield for sure. That is also the competition standard for folks playing uh, nationally, internationally, anything like that. All right, Hector asks, what footwear do you recommend to keep your toes warm? Uh, toes warm. I don't know about warm. You can go ahead. So I'm wearing shoes, just regular shoes, but uh, honestly, if you take some hockey skates and take the blades off, this is going to give you the more protection that you need. Uh, I, I don't wear them right now because they didn't fit in this one, but uh, taking a blade off and just using a regular hockey uh, shoe or hockey skate would be the best way to go to yeah, give you the most protection. Also, if you get to a point where you're out of the entry level sled and into the, the larger one or into the more expensive one, get the wrap around. This right here saves my feet quite a bit, just having this wrapping around the outside of my foot. Now, I'll still get a puck once in a while, but I'm not getting a skate slammed into the side of my uh, foot. And that's a good question. I just want to say it again, back to the safety again, especially for folks who may not have full sensation or wherever the case is. Having something, a hockey skate, these have plastic all around them. So that will stop someone from getting a stick. I can whack that pretty good. Again, Eric's not doing it today. It's fine. But if you're going to be playing out there a lot with a lot of other players, especially a higher level player, that puck flying through the air can break your foot. So make sure that you're wearing something to protect them. All right, question. Matt asks, is there a different sled if someone just wants to go out and skate but not play hockey? Sure. There's a variety of companies, and again, we're not, I'm not going to be watch me not endorse any particular company. We're out there. There's three or four manufacturers who do that. So there is both from the, there's a range. So Eric's on something that's called a razor. I call it it's not a hundred percent custom made sled, but it has given he's been able to adapt both the height off the ice as well as the back and a variety of other things. This has taken his game to the next level. There's probably a there is a recreational level underneath that one. And then there's even probably a very basic level underneath that. So yes, the answer to your question is there are skates, skates for all abilities and what you're trying to do. So it could be a recreational piece that doesn't even have a bucket, just kind of more of a seat for people to sit in all the way up to a fully custom sled that is built and set up for you individually. By the way, we're both vaccinated. That's why we decided to go without masks. <laughs> we just thought we'd I don't want anybody to worry about it. We're, we're vaccinated twice, so we're good. We're good. Well, hey, I know we're getting near the end of the time. I want to thank everybody who tuned in this morning, learned a little bit about sled hockey again, especially to the folks and staff at the Winter Sports Clinic adapting in this very uh, kind of strange and challenging time. I want to thank Eric uh, for coming out down here with me right and early here in Colorado and, and, and just really want everyone to get out there involved. 
any questions, please check back in the Winter Sports Clinic website. We'll answer those questions, get some resources on there, and we really hope to see you out on the ice.